thanks so much. And thanks to Designers and Geeks. And thanks to Yelp. Uh, I'm happy to be here. So the example that I want to begin with tonight is one that I think will be familiar and perhaps painfully familiar to those of us here in this room, which is uh, looking for a place to live in San Francisco. Um, now, in a typical you know, consumer decision-making situation, we have this idea of the rational consumer that uh, you, know, you go out and you look at a bunch of options and you think about the one that you like the best and then you pick it and you're done. Well, as anyone who's tried to look for an apartment in San Francisco knows, um, it doesn't necessarily work that way. In reality, what happens is you know, a listing goes up and within the first you know, 10 minutes, enough people have emailed the person to mob the open house and you go to the open house and you know, in many cases, the, the keys end up in the hands of the person who can physically foist a deposit check into the landlord's hands first. <clears throat> now, such a savage marketplace leaves comparatively little room for the kind of deliberative, rational decision making that, that we normally expect. Um, instead, you're put into a position where you have to make a binding commitment either way. You can either take the place in front of you, uh, hand that check over on the spot, in which case you forsake all future possible things that might also have been out there, or you can walk away, in which case you can be sure that someone else has snatched it up and you have lost the ability to change your mind later if it turns out that that really was your best option. So we're left in a situation that looks a, a little bit like a paradox. How do you try to get the best apartment that you can? How do you try to make an informed decision when the very act of gathering information uh, involves these irrevocable commitments that may cost you your very best opportunity? Um, it's a cruel scenario, and fortunately, there's an answer, and I'm happy to share it with you. The answer is 37%. So if you want the very best probability of getting the very best apartment, then spend the first 37% of your search, uh, leave the checkbook at home, you are just calibrating. Uh, stay your hand and don't take anything no matter how good it looks. After that first 37%, so uh, 11 days if you've given yourself a month, after that first 11 days, be prepared to commit to the very first place that you see that's better than what you saw in that first 37%. Uh, now, this is not merely the, uh, an, an intuitively satisfying compromise between looking and leaping. This is the provably optimal result. And we know this because the search for an apartment uh, falls into a category of problems that mathematicians and computer scientists know as optimal stopping problems. And they apply to any situation in life where you face a sequence of options and you must make a choice at each step of the way, whether to take the thing in front of you or to say no, turn it down, and continue on. Um, now, many people have argued that this decision-making structure not only describes our search for an apartment in a sufficiently competitive uh, real estate market, but it also describes our search for love. And there are many who have argued that optimal stopping is, in fact, the mathematics of serial monogamy. And even some who have gone so far as to apply the 37% rule directly to their romantic lives, um, creating some kind of interval over which they hope to find their mate. Uh, computing what 37% of that interval is, in this case, 26.1, uh, and deciding this is the point at which dating transitions from just being out there having fun to being prepared for things to get serious. Of course, it all depends on the assumptions that one is willing to make about love. Now, the thesis of this book, which I should say is joint work between myself and a good friend of mine, Tom Griffiths, who is a computational cognitive scientist at UC Berkeley, uh, the, the hypothesis of this book, the, the, the animating thesis of this book, is very straightforward. There is a, a class of problems, a set of problems that all people face in the course of daily life, whether it's finding a place to live, deciding where to go out to eat, 
organizing your messy office or managing your time, um, there's this set of problems that we think of as, in some sense, intrinsically and uniquely human problems. And the punchline is that they're not. Uh, they, in fact, correspond rather tightly, and I, and I would argue profoundly, to a class of some of the canonical problems in computer science. And this gives us an opportunity to hopefully learn something about how to make better decisions in our own lives by looking at the structure of these problems and the structure of their optimal solutions. So the book ultimately pursues this line of argument, uh, and, and it takes this lens to 12 different domains. And we'll talk about two of them in greater detail, and then I will summarize the, the rest at the end. So first, uh, let's have a closer look at, at this domain of optimal stopping problems. So the, the canonical, the most famous optimal stopping problem of them all is called the secretary problem. And uh, I'm sure it's familiar to some of you in the audience. Basic structure uh, is you're hiring a secretary. Uh, N candidates show up. They show up in a random order. And you interview them one at a time. And after each interview, you either hire the secretary uh, on the spot, send everyone else home, or you dismiss the person, in which case you don't have the ability to change your mind and call them back. Um, and it is this that led to the now famous 37% rule, or the, the 1 over E rule if you're, you're interested in knowing what the other decimal points are. Um, so the, the popularizer of this problem was the mathematician Martin Gardner, who first sort of brought the problem to the American mathematical consciousness uh, through a column in Scientific uh, American in 1960. But the problem itself goes back uh, more than a decade prior to that. In fact, its first appearance uh, is in a lecture by this guy, uh, the University of Michigan mathematician Merrill Flood, who was giving a talk uh, in uh, 1949 at Princeton University. And it seems that Merrill Flood already had the problem's romantic connotations on his mind. You see, in the audience of his 1949 talk was Flood's 18-year-old daughter, who had just recently started dating a much older man. Now, Flood and his wife sternly disapproved of this, and they thought about ways that they might make their disapproval known to their daughter. So Flood, knowing that his daughter is going to be taking the minutes at this mathematics conference, decides to give a presentation on the secretary problem. And at this time, the 37% rule was not yet known. Uh, but he hoped that his daughter might take the hint that the correct answer was probably more than one. Um, fortunately, that relationship was indeed short-lived. Um, and in the book, we explore the, the consequences of mathematicians and computer scientists uh, facing some of these problems in their own lives and trying to apply the logic of uh, optimal stopping with, I think it's fair to say, mixed results. Um, so the, one of my favorite examples of this is the Carnegie Mellon professor of operations research, Michael Trick. So Michael Trick, uh, as a young man, he was a graduate student uh, abroad, living abroad in Europe. And he was dating this woman. And he was asking himself, you know, how do I know when it's time to really settle down? And all of a sudden, it struck him, oh, of course. Dating is, an, is like a secretary problem. So I should just compute 37% of the time over which I want to find someone. And uh, it turned out to be 26.1 years old. And it coincidentally was his exact age at the time. And so he knew exactly what to do. He proposes on the spot. And she shoots him down. So Michael Trick. Uh, encountered firsthand one of the ways in which real life does not always model all of the assumptions of the classical secretary problem. And in particular, Trick uh, bumped up against something that is known in the mathematical literature as rejection. Um, that is, in fact, its, its proper name. Um, well, fortunately, uh, mathematicians have done the work and have figured out the optimal stopping policy in cases where you have the ability to get rejected. Uh, and so it turns out, for example, that if you have a 50% chance of your offer being declined, then the optimal point at which to switch from looking to leaping is just 25%. So the operating logic here appears to be something like propose early, 
and often. <laughs> now, one of the other uh, eminent mathematicians that we talk about in the book who encountered a scenario like this in their own life was the great astronomer Johannes Kepler. And after the death of his first wife, Kepler embarks on this epic series of courtships to try to find the perfect second wife. And he has his friends introduce him to all of their single friends. And he ends up uh, courting all of these women one after another. And um, he writes very candidly about this in his diary. He says, for example, that uh, woman number four charms him, he writes, because of her tall build and athletic body. Um, and yet, nonetheless, he decides to persist in his search. Um, he likes candidate number five even better, and she gets along with the kids. But he continues on. And somewhere around the 11th or 12th um, woman that he's courting, he has one of these sinking realizations of, you know, my god, I've, I've made a terrible mistake. Uh, number five was the, was the one all along. And so he gets on a train back to Regensburg as quickly as possible and apologizes to this woman for dating you know, a half dozen other people in the interim and says, if there's any chance that you're still available and you would take me back, um, I'd love to marry you. Uh, and, and fortunately for him, she agrees. So uh, Kepler experienced what is known in the literature as recall. So uh, if you have the ability to go back to a declined opportunity, um, then you can modify the optimal stopping policy to take account of this as well. And so, for example, if you have a 50% chance of uh, being able to recall a, a past opportunity, then the optimal stopping threshold becomes 61%. So you should not make any offers uh, until you are at least 61% of the way into your search. And only then, if there is no one in the remaining 39% that's better than the best person from the first 61%, uh, get on that train to Regensburg and prepare your best apology. Now, in his diary, Kepler um, is sort of anguished about this. He talks about how could I have been so stupid as to continue seeing all these different women. Um, and he, he bemoans what he calls his restlessness and doubtfulness. Um, and it would, it would perhaps put his mind at ease, although perhaps not put his second wife's mind at ease, to know that, in effect, restlessness and doubtfulness uh, do turn out to be part of the optimal strategy when you have the ability to recall. Now, uh, this, this sequential decision-making structure applies not only to our search for housing and love, uh, but also to another acutely problematic domain for those of us who live in San Francisco, which is where to park. Um, so the, uh, I think we've all had this experience of being in a situation where you know, you're, you're on your way to a destination and a spot appears and you ask yourself, okay, do I just pull in and take it and end up perhaps walking by umpteen even better spots and feeling like a fool? Or do I keep holding out for a better spot and maybe there is no better spot and I end up circling all the way back around and of course someone has now taken that as well and I'm totally out of luck. Um, well, fortunately, we've got some, uh, some optimal strategies for you here as well. So it turns out that the optimal stopping point depends entirely on what's called the occupancy rate, or what percentage of the spots in that area are filled. And we provide a handy table. You can cut it out and paste it on your steering wheel, your dashboard. <laughs> Um, so, for example, if, uh, if the spaces in this neighborhood are 90% full, then you should not take a parking space until you are just seven spots away from your destination. Um, if it is 99% occupied, which is maybe a little bit closer to accurate, uh, then you should be willing to park starting 69 spaces away from your destination, which is like something like a quarter of a mile. Um, beyond that, as you can see, it, it spirals out of control rapidly, and we actually recommend that you just don't bring your car at all. Um, and this is a case where I think the looking at the optimal strategies not only gives us some advice about what to do behind the wheel, but also lets us think about parking as a design problem. And so one of the things that, that really comes to light when you look at this is that going from, let's say, 90% occupancy to 99% occupancy, um, 
only accommodates 9% more cars, and yet it results in everyone's search for a parking space and ultimate walking distance uh, to, to increase by tenfold. Um, and so this has, this has led to a little bit of a quiet revolution in the way that urban planners think about the allocation of uh, free street-side parking. So traditionally, this has just been viewed as, we have all these spaces, let's just ma maximize the utilization of this resource. Um, but in fact, when you start to appreciate the computational dimension of the problem, uh, it becomes clear that pushing you know, to uh, nearly 100% occupancy is actually bad for everyone involved. And it results in um, you know, many fold more circling the block and people holding up traffic because they're looking for a space and so forth. And in fact, San Francisco is the first city to pilot a program of dynamically adjusting parking meter prices uh, that stabilize the occupancy rate at 85%. Um, and the downside is that, of course, they are, tend to be much more expensive than they are in other cities. Uh, the upside is that you do not have this endless loop where you're searching for parking. Um, now, this, this sequential structure where at each point in time you're forced to make this kind of binding once and for all commitment, um, even though it arguably describes some of the scenarios that we've been talking about, you know, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this is a little bit far-fetched for most sort of human decisions. Um, but in fact, optimal stopping describes uh, any class of problems where you pay some cost for continuing to gather information or continuing to look and continuing to explore more options. And given that we are all, of course, human and constrained by time, um, I think it's fair to say that, in effect, every decision that we make ends up in part being a decision about when to stop. Now, there's a second category of problems that we're going to talk about, which uh, unlike optimal stopping, where you make a single binding commitment, uh, encompasses a, a set of problems that we make over and over again in an iterated fashion. So to give you an example, let's say you're deciding, you know, every, every night you decide where to go out to eat. Uh, it turns out there are companies that are really helpful in providing you information uh, for making decisions of this nature. Uh, you may have heard of some of them. Um, and so often we're faced with a decision of, do we, do we go to one of our favorite places or do we try something new? On the way there, uh, you, know, you open, let's say, Spotify, and you have this choice between, do you want to listen to one of your favorite most played records, or do you want to hit the Discover tab and try to see artists that you don't know about yet? Um, and who do you bring? Do you bring one of your closest friends or your spouse or your sibling, or do you want to reach out to the new coworker that joined the office or the, an acquaintance that you'd like to get to know better? So in, in each case, the, the, the decision fundamentally takes the form of a tension between doing our favorite things and trying something new. Now, intuitively, I think most of us understand the, the idea that you know, a life well lived is some combination of these two things, some blend of doing what you know and love and staying open to new possibilities. But of course, our intuitions don't necessarily tell us what that balance should be. Now, fortunately, computer scientists have been working on finding this exact balance for something like the last 60 years, and they even have a name for it. They call it the explore-exploit trade-off. Um, now, in English, these words have radically different connotations where exploration is taken to be almost a, a, a default good, and exploitation is taken to be almost by default bad. But we have, to, we have to think of these as value-neutral terms, uh, the way that a computer scientist would think about them. So exploration here just means spending your time and energy gathering information. And exploiting just means spending your time and energy leveraging the information that you already have to get a known good result. Um, now, this architecture comes up most pointedly in the domain of ad optimization. So if you're any company that makes money selling ads, uh, you have this canonical problem of someone makes a search, and you have this pool of candidate ads that you could show. There are some that have the best track record of getting clicks, um, and there are others that you just have less information about, or perhaps they're, they're new to the system. So here the explore-exploit tension becomes completely explicit of literally what percentage of users see the best performing thing and what percentage see these new variations that could be better and could be worse. 
in what is, I think, one of the most interesting developments in this area, uh, algorithms that have been honed in tech companies to solve problems like this are now catching the attention of, for example, the FDA, where they're being used to rethink clinical trials. So I don't know if Morpheus is, is perhaps the best mascot for American clinical trials, um, but you can very much frame that sort of a decision in the same terminology of if you have some condition, there is a, there is a known best conventional treatment and there's any number of experimental treatments. And so how do we make the ba balance between uh, who gets one and who gets the other? So we'll, we'll come back to that point in a second. How would a computer scientist approach this problem? So the canonical problem in the computer science literature is called the multi-armed bandit problem. I, I suspect it's familiar to some of the engineers in the room. Um, if, if you find the name a little bit strange, it comes from the nickname of a slot machine as the one-armed bandit, right? So a multi-armed bandit is a room full of slot machines. Um, so you imagine that you've walked into a room full of slot machines. Some of them you are given to understand pay off with higher probability. Others uh, pay out less often. And you're going to be there for, let's say, an afternoon. Quite simply, what do you do to try to make the most money that you possibly can? Well, it's going to involve some combination of you know, trying different machines out to see what, what appears promising, and a certain amount of time being spent just hammering away, cranking away at the machines that appear to pay out the most. Um, of course, exactly what that balance should look like is, is of course, the question. And for most of the 20th century, this was considered not only an unsolved problem, but an unsolvable problem uh, by the math community. So the British uh, mathematicians during World War II, for example, joked about dropping the multi-armed bandit problem over Germany as the ultimate instrument of intellectual sabotage uh, to just waste the brain power of the German mathematicians. Um, and in fact, it was considered basically career suicide to study it because it was just known to be an impossible problem. But to the field's own surprise in many ways, uh, we did start chipping away at the problem in the second half of the 20th century. And one of the people that made the first inroads is this guy, Richard Bellman, uh, who developed a technique called dynamic programming that was able to start giving the first exact solutions to this problem, provided that you had a sufficient amount of computational time and a bunch of assumptions held. Um, and it's interesting to look at the structure of some of these exact solutions um, because I think they really start to tell us something about the nature of the problem. So for example, um, imagine that you're playing a machine, uh, you're in a casino that has just two machines. Uh, the first one you've played 15 times and nine times it paid out, six times it did not. The second machine you've played twice and once it paid out and once it did not. Um, so, simply put, what do you do? Which machine do you pull on your, on your next turn? Well, I think the most straightforward, kind of naive way of approaching this problem is just to say, okay, the first one paid out 60% of the time, the second one paid out 50% of the time, so let's just pull the machine with the higher expected value. Um, and yet there's a sense that we just don't know enough about the second machine to totally write it off. So, how do we make a decision like this? Well, the real insight that comes from looking at this is that it all depends on exactly how long you plan to be in the casino. So by analogy, imagine that you have moved abroad to Madrid uh, for a year to, to take a job. Now your first night you go out to a restaurant and it is literally the greatest restaurant you have ever been to in Spain. Uh, the second night you try a different restaurant it's got a 50-50 chance of being the greatest restaurant you've ever been to in Spain. Um, the third night, of course, you're down to a one in three shot, but that's still pretty good. Um, and of course, you can, see, you can see where this goes. So the, the odds of making this great new discovery that blows everything you've experienced thus far out of the water um, goes down uh, with the, the harmonic series. It, it goes down as a result of the experience that you have in this domain. So, so the odds just get progressively worse the more things you try. Um, and to compound this, the value of discovering a great new restaurant also is monotonically decreasing as, as you go through your stay 
because you just simply run out of opportunities to go back. So discovering the same restaurant nine months in is strictly worse than discovering it three months in, because you've lost out on six months of, of opportunity to go there. Um, the bright side is that the value of just going to the best place that you know about is monotonically increasing the longer that you stay there. Um, because the best place you know about can only get better, by definition, uh, the more places that you try. And so for all three of these reasons, um, you can start to get the sense that there is, there is a trajectory that as we move through this interval of time, we should, our, our decision making should naturally start to change from a more exploratory mode to a more exploitative mode. Uh, simply as a function of where, where we are in, in relationship to our time. So this insight, for example, has made me, uh, among other things, totally rethink one of my favorite films, which is the 1989 inspirational classic Dead Poet Society, starring Robin Williams um, as this uh, poetry professor, John Keating, that gives these rousing soliloquies like, seize the day, boys, make your lives extraordinary. And equipped with the knowledge of the multi arm bandit problem, I think it's, it's fair to cry foul here and say that, in fact, Robin Williams appears to be giving us two mutually exclusive pieces of advice. Um, if we are just trying to seize the day, then by all means, we should go with the machine with the higher expected value. But if we're trying to make our lives extraordinary, then surely there's room to continue exploring. Um, now, this way of thinking has not only shaped the way that computer scientists approach these problems, but is also making its way into cognitive science and psychology, where it is undergirding um, a new set of theories that are, are leading psychologists to rethink how we, uh, how we think about being young and being old. And so, to represent the early years in life, um, I've provided this picture of an infant plugging a power cord into its face. And I think this really captures some of the preconceptions that we have about the young. Um, namely, that they're just not very good at life. Um, they, uh, they're very random. They have a very short attention span. The psychology literature shows strongly this high novelty bias, which is, you know, no matter how cool of a toy you get them on Christmas, they're just relentlessly interested in the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Um, and in fact, there, there is something almost unique to the human species in terms of just how inept our young are. And I think uh, my favorite example of this is that a, a baby gazelle, uh, three hours after being born, can escape predation by a cheetah uh, running at like, 50 or 60 miles an hour. Uh, whereas humans are basically useless for like 20 years at the beginning of life. <laughs> um, so it's, it's been sort of an open problem in developmental psychology of, of how do we reconcile this uh, glaring ineptitude with humans' dominance you know, as, as a species in general. And one of the people who's, I think, done the most to change the way that we think about this is UC Berkeley's Alison Gopnik. And she has appealed to the mechanics of the multi arm bandit problem and this explore-exploit trade-off to make the argument that, in fact, um, infants are not inept. They are doing exactly what they should be doing, given where they are in life. So if you imagine that you've just burst through the doors of life's casino, you're going to be there for a good 85 years, you really should just run around pulling handles completely at random. Um, you really should you know, put every item in your living room into your mouth at least once, um, because it might be delicious. And if it is, you have 85 years to enjoy it. Um, and what's more, this also starts to offer an explanation for this long period of, of dependency, which is uh, the, the baby gazelle needs to actually function in the world because it's exposed to the harms of the world right out of the gate. And so the gazelle doesn't have time to like take up the flute or learn how to pole vault or whatever. Um, whereas humans, precisely because the moms and the dads of the world are paying the rent and putting food on the table and, and, and so forth, um, it in effect liberates us to be more purely exploratory. Um, we, do, we are not dependent on those early payouts 
you know, to, to, for our lunch money. And so that enables a more purely exploratory approach to the beginning of life, um, which should pay dividends in the long run. Now, uh, likewise, we, we have sort of a contrary set of preconceptions about uh, older adults. You know, we have this notion that they are kind of rigid and set in their ways and resistant to new ideas, resistant to change. Um, there's a large psychology literature to the effect that they maintain um, fewer social ties. Older adults maintain fewer social ties, a smaller kind of social radius than young people do. And it's tempting to view this, especially as a young person, and say, oh, it must just be kind of sad. You know, you like lose touch with your friends. Um, that it must be kind of lonely getting older. Um, in fact, uh, many psychologists, led in part by Stanford's Laura Karstensen, are making the argument that no, in fact, older adults have simply reached the exploit phase of their life. They are aware, on the one hand, of how many people they've met, and so their favorite people are their favorites among a huge sampling of the population. And they're also aware of the finite amount of time that they have left. And so it, it merely makes sense to focus more of that time on the people that really matter. Um, and what's more, you should expect, uh, if you just think about the problem mathematically, you should expect that the average payout of a veteran in the casino is going to be higher than someone who's at the beginning of their time both because of their uh, greater experience and because of their exploit-based strategy, where they are spending more of the time on the machines that pay out uh, the, the best. And so we should actually imagine from this that older adults are, in fact, consistently happier than younger people. And Carsonson's research shows that uh, this is, in fact, the case. Uh, and this is, in fact, a deliberate and kind of purposeful strategy on the part of older adults, and that they're happier for it. Um, contemporary research into the multi arm bandit problem has been motivated by trying to formalize a concept that I think hits home for a lot of us when we think about the choices that we might have made, which is the idea of regret. And I find it really lovely that uh, you, there's a formal definition for what regret is in the multi arm bandit problem. Namely, it is the amount of money that you could have made if only you knew at the beginning everything that you knew by the time you were done. Um, and so this, this enables us to quantify regret and show how different algorithms and different strategies um, produce different, different amounts of regret. Um, and one of, the, one of the big results that's, that's come more recently uh, is what does our regret look like if we are following an optimal strategy in the multi arm bandit problem? And I have good news and bad news. Um, the, the curve looks like this. It's logarithmic. And so the bad news is that even when you are following an optimal strategy, you will never stop making more mistakes. Uh, your total amount of life's regret will never stop going up. Um, I'm sorry to break it to you, but that's just how it is. Uh, the good news, however, is that uh, the logarithmic curve means that the both the frequency and the intensity of new regrets uh, will forever be diminishing over time. And I think, I think that's something we can all kind of live with. Um, now, computer scientists are interested in what class of algorithms can offer this guarantee of minimal logarithmic regret. Um, and there are several in particular that are, are widely used today. And if you're interested, we can talk more about exactly what they look like. Um, but the, th the thing for me that's really significant about this is um, if you think about the, the, the classic medical randomized control trial, uh, you just give 50% of the people one thing and 50% of the people the other thing, and then you see what happens at the end. You know, that's equivalent to saying, well, there's these two machines, and I'm just going to pull each handle, you know, one, one after another 50% uh, of the time, regardless of the information that I'm gathering in the act of doing so. Um, which, I don't know if there are engineers here that do A-B testing and so forth. That would seem insane and kind of medieval. Um, and yet, this is what we do where the, where the human stakes are the highest. So um, there's actually been this gathering movement of computer scientists, biostatisticians, and doctors uh, making the argument that, wait a minute, computer science has had for many years algorithms that can offer us guarantees 
on the amount of mistakes that they will make and can, can leverage the information that's coming in during the course of a trial uh, to guide the, the rest of that trial. And I'm very encouraged, for example, that the FDA, as recently as 2015, has issued what they call a draft guidance document, which is basically their version of saying, yes, we think it's worth considering the possibility of evaluating the efficacy of uh, further study on this issue, um, which is about as good as you can get uh, at the moment. And I'm, I'm really kind of heartened at, at the way that these results are, in fact, moving into these uh, human domains. And so you know, here's a case where understanding this underlying computational structure to the problem uh, gives us payouts at a, at, at a number of different scales. For one, it gives us some practical advice about these daily life decisions, like whether to go to your favorite restaurant or try something new. Secondly, it, it can offer us something philosophically about the arc of a human life and how our decision making naturally should change uh, as, as we go through life. And third, it, it offers us, um, especially in the medical case, surprisingly concrete and explicit advice in the cases where we need it the most. Um, now, as I mentioned, the book ultimately ends up following this line of thinking over uh, 12 different domains. So, you know, in sorting, we look at what computer science can tell you about the, the most effective way to organize your bookshelf, but more importantly, whether you should. Um, in caching, we look at uh, how the home organization advice of people like Martha Stewart uh, stacks up to the best practices of computer uh, caching experts that have their own ideas about how best to allocate limited storage space. Um, in scheduling, we look at the question of time management from the perspective of computer science. And in our chapter on Bayes' rule, we talk about how to make uh, rational predictions about the future, whether it's how long to wait, how long you can expect to wait for the next muni bus to come, or you know, if you've been in a, a new relationship and you've been dating for a few months, things are going pretty well. Is it premature to book the, the New Year's Eve package at Tahoe? Um, we offer you some precise uh, rational guidance on this point as well. Um, and then in the second half of the book, we turn to cases where uh, what do you do when you're up against a problem that's sufficiently complicated that there just is no straightforward effective algorithm that's going to reliably give you the right answer? Um, and there's this whole domain of problems that are known as NP-hard problems or intractable problems. And of course, what do computer scientists do in this situation? They don't simply give up. Rather, they have an entire toolkit of strategies for making headway, even when you don't have a guaranteed and reliable path to the correct answer. Um, and it's in this area that we end up, I think, with one of the book's uh, largest scale takeaways, which is an opportunity to rethink our idea of rationality itself. So specifically, you know, we have this idea that thinking rationally means being exhaustive, you know, considering all the possible consequences of your actions or all the possibilities available to you. You know, it's deterministic. You follow a reliable approach that's going to produce the same outcome every time. And it's exact. When you arrive at an answer, you, you arrive at it with total precision and total certainty. In fact, one of the, one of the real lessons that uh, you get by looking at the computer science of intractable problems is that against problems of real world complexity, you don't have the luxury to do any of these things in many cases. So good algorithms will, for example, consider just a subset of the possibilities available and will trade off the cost of making a mistake against the cost of simply computing for longer. Um, they are often non-deterministic and inexact. Uh, they use approximations. They use randomness. Uh, one of my very favorite examples of this is the algorithm that is used if you're generating like an SSL certificate. You need a, a huge random prime number. And so computer scientists have come to care about efficient ways of determining whether a huge random number is, in fact, prime or not. Uh, and the, the algorithm that we use in practice is called the Miller-Rabin test, which happens to be wrong a fourth of the time. Um, and so when I talk to developers at places like OpenSSL, I say, well, what do, you, what do you do to get around this problem? You know, you're generating certificates like for banks, for the military. Like the, this, it's kind of important that these numbers be prime. And they say, well, we just run it 40 times. Um, so then you just have a 1 over 4 to the 40th power chance of being wrong. And you know, the entire world has just kind of accepted that that's good enough. 
Um, and, and to make matters even more intriguing, uh, a several years ago, someone did find a polynomial time deterministic primality test, but we still use the random one um, because it's just, it's just that much more effective. So in many cases, getting, getting to near certainty uh, is dramatically better than getting to total certainty and, and calculating uh, for much longer. And so out of this comes, uh, out of this way of thinking about human problems comes a series of prescriptions that, that don't necessarily look like the kind of advice that you would expect to get from a book that applies computer science to, to human decision making. Um, they say things like, don't always consider all your options. Don't always go for the outcome that seems best every time. Make a mess on occasion. Travel light. Let things wait. Trust your instincts and don't think too long. Relax. Sometimes even toss a coin. And unlike the advice that you might find in, say, most self-help books, they're backed by proofs. Thanks. <laughs>